We're in uh, chapter 32. Chapter 32, page Kufchov Beis, second column, bottom paragraph. Vamarte Elo Komar Hashem. What should you say to Paro? This is what Hashem had said. Vamakas Svardim Lo Nema Hashem Eloke Ivrim. Regarding the maka of the Tzvardim, the frogs, Moshe didn't refer to God as Elokei o Ivrim, the God of the Hebrews. Rakoma Komer Hashem, without Elokei Ivrim. Hashem Ham Yuchod, the name which Hashem used regarding the Tzvardim was Yud Kevav Kei. Vachem B'makas Orov, regarding the plague of Orov, that's the wild beasts, Nemar Gamkim Shem Em Yuchod. So why in regard to the frogs did he say Eloki Ivrim? Only by regarding Tzvardim and Oro Fatam, Ki Be'elo Shtei Hamakos Nodlem Shema Hashem. In regard to these two plagues, it was known to Egypt that God is the all-encompassing God. He's more than just a power. Why? Hamakos Tzvardim Nemar. What does it say regarding the plague of Tzvardim? He says, when do you want the plague removed? Tomorrow. You will know there's no one like our God. I will separate. The wild beasts did not, did not go into Goshen. They were only in Egypt proper. That you should know I'm God in the midst of the, the land. Since the, what was to be drawn from these two plagues was God is the omnipotent being, therefore it's just Yutke Vovke. It's not Eloke, even the God of the Hebrews. He's the all-encompassing God. The Maral says, There's something unique about these two Makos. Shenod Lem Hashem Em Yuchod. Paro continuously, he reneged. So Moshe says to Paro, dare me. Anything you ask, dare me. When do you want I should pray for you? This is regarding the frogs. Here he feels it's the equivalent of death. And he says, when, sh when should I remove the plague? Dare me tomorrow. Exactly. The moment you want it to be removed, that's exactly when it's going to be removed. And as a result of that, from that you will know that God dictates every aspect of existence. An action, something which is natural or something which is a decree from heaven, nature has, runs its course. So if nature runs its course, so how could you set a specific time? So you see clearly, this is unrelated to nature. This override nature. If it has to do with the zodiac, also, it's locked in to what the Zodiac dictates. So he says to Paro, when, when do you want I should pray on your behalf? And at exactly that moment that will set, that's when it's happening. But what about nature? Nature has to run its course. The Zodiac dictates. This is unrelated to the Zodiac. This is unrelated to nature. Nire borur. From this, it confirms, without question, on an uncontestable level, that God is unique, God is one of a kind, all that exists, He's removed, He transcends all existence. If God dictates, if God is within existence, God is bound to the laws of existence. But if God transcends existence, he's not 
bound by the zodiac, he's not bound by nature. Unrelated. Therefore, though nature says nature has to run its course, the frogs have to be here for a certain period of time. And based on their whatever may be, what dictates their behavior, it's unheard of. You have predator animals. It's interesting. The Mars is in Tainus. That if you see a migration of predator animals, even though it hasn't ro reached your location, you have to start fasting and praying. Why? Because once the migration starts, you cannot stop it. But it may be hundreds of miles away. But it's a migration. So here you have an infestation of wild predator animals and yet when they come to the border of Goshen they don't cross the border but it's a migration that will show that God dictates there's no there's no one like God in existence when God was able to separate at Goshen that the Orov this infestation of predator animals wild beasts did not enter that location that that he separated and designated Eretz Goshen not to be the location for for these predative animals. Just as God is unique, He designates location. What's naturally spoken migrations? I mean, how do you stop the movement of animals? Right? The migration of animals. It shows the uniqueness of God, that God controls everything. The only one who controls in such a specific way, it, it, it reflects on who he is, that he's one of a kind. There's no deity, there's no power that has this ability to have this level of control up to this point and not beyond that point. Something that's of the natural order or that's set by the zodiac, they can't dictate to this in such a degree. Although the zodiac, it has its times, certain things should happen. The zodiac affects in its proper time. Based on the situation of where the star is located, but time, how do you determine time? This time and not that time. Location says locate, but time. It will come here, it will not be there. But he sets a specific time. And it's not possible that this level of control and specific specificity He's asked now an interesting question. It says, we understand the frogs. When do you want them to be removed? So, when nature takes its course, this supersedes nature. But what about the migration of the animals? See, yes, what about the Makov Dam. There was blood in Goshen. Right? The Jews had water, but the Jews had water. The Jew would pick up that same blood, it was water. The Egyptian would take that same blood, it's blood. So why that discernment, why they're discerning between what the Jew did and what the non Jew did, why didn't that also reveal and establish there's no one comparable to God? So he's asking, Bavagav Shaddam Bikinim, says Kinim, lice. All these plagues were not in Goshen. Because there's was something more unique about the migration of animals. It's what I quoted the Gemara in Tainus. 
once animals stop migrating, there's no stopping them. So if they migrate, so why did it stop at the border of Goshen? You can have blood, lice, whatever it may be, it's limited to a certain location. But migration of animals, why only to that point, not beyond that point? Where we find comes to lice, the certain locations which have infestations of lice. Although the or the Nile flowed through Goshen, that part of the Nile wasn't stricken. So therefore, discerning it happened here, not there, it's not a question. You know, it's interesting. We had the, um, the earthquake in Haiti. So Haiti and the Dominican Republic are the same island. We're talking about, it's like there were two ends of the world. Haiti was struck, devastated. It came to the line of the Dominican Republic. Did not cross that line. One is civilized, built, advanced, cultured. The other is totally primitive. The primitive part of the island was destroyed. Level of dev devastation, suffering, death. The other wasn't touched. It's a miracle. What does it show? It says something. But it's not quite this. It happens. Many years ago, there was a certain uh, family, Syrian family, where the uh, father had gone to the Far East, to Japan, in the 20s. And he became phenomenally wealthy. He was the wealthiest non-Oriental person, citizen. And he was worth, in the 60s, maybe a billion dollars. And his children became Bali Chuba, his three children, came from Aleppo. And the Japanese government could not believe that they're, very, they're racist, they're elitist people. The how is it possible that a Jew and a Caucasian could succeed? Especially, it must be he did illegal things. He definitely violated. So what did they do? They froze the estate. When he died, they froze the estate. They did not allow the kids to take part of the, of the estate. The family spent hundreds of millions of dollars. But in Japan, no law firm, no accounting firm could go against the government. Because that means you're disgracing your culture. So they settled. There's a question how much they settled for. It's a secret. Maybe a hundred, whatever they settled for. So what happened? They, the family lived in Kobe, Japan. They lived in Kobe. If you remember, many years ago, there was an earthquake in Kobe. If you saw pictures, if you saw pictures of the earthquake, the rail system, it was twisted, unbelievable destruction. They still own properties, this family. After they settled, they own parking lots, they own buildings. The earthquake line went up to their property and stopped exactly at this family's property. Did not cross the, the boundary into their property. Their property remained intact. Everything was destroyed. Their property was left untouched. And they say, you know, Hashem has his revenge. Okay? This is a fifth place. I will differentiate between Egypt and Goshen. But it happens. The, earth, the fault line all goes to a certain point. Okay? Hashem says, the plague of Borod, the hail will not fall in Goshen. Hashem says, the most, extend your hand towards heaven with the staff. He didn't say anything. We're specific. Heaven. So heaven covers Goshen. You would think the plague covered all Egypt, including Goshen. You're going to have two sides of the street. One side of the street is hail. The other side is not hail. But again, he's saying, what is the nature of animals when they migrate? The migration, you can't stop it. The 
infestation of animals. They should have migrated. Why didn't they? Naturally. Komakomis lefi ritzono. Bavokena arbe. But what about locust? Enumis pashe lefi shederach arbe shlo yispari din emiseh. This he says, the nature of locusts, they're very cliquish. They stay together. Animals are not. You have all kinds of, they go, they just keep moving. The predator animals, they go, they forage all over. So why did they go to Goshen? And when, when the, the exact moment they were meant to be removed from Egypt, they, how do you remove them? They, they're out of control. How do you control this level of infestation? This shows us the uniqueness of God's power. There's no one, no power is comparable to our God. He's unique. Through the plague of Dam, blood you will know I am God. There's no match. Right? Only the name Yudke Vopke is mentioned. He says, although all the other plagues were supernatural events, and blood was also water turning to blood, but the, the, the wonder of blood, that Maka, was at another level. What, what was so unique about it? Because the frogs and the lice, because it's naturally the water gives forth frogs. So there were more frogs, less frogs. Okay? So there was an explosion of frogs. You find earth, dust, the lice. So here there's a level of intensity of lice unheard of. But it's within the char characteristic of water to give forth frogs. So there were more. You find lice within dust and with sand. So it was a greater degree. It happened. These things happen. They had boils. A person like is exposed to an irritant. Irritant. Body breaks out with oils. You know, you ever saw pictures in Vietnam when they dropped those napalm bombs or whatever they... Irritants. They what? They, they immediately, they, they develop rashes. What? You never know. The irritants. Locust happens. There there was no change in nature. There was, there was an absence of light. Absence of light is darkness. But there's nothing unusual. You know, you, you close the window shades. You have room darkness. It looks like night. You have an eclipse. You have an eclipse. You have darkness in the middle of the day. But water should be converted to blood. What relevance does water have to blood? It has no relevance. And what is it we say? What's Mosim? Zehadam. Mofis is a wonder. It's interesting, you find that, as I pointed out, when Moshe originally had said the plague of blood was going to come, he says, and the fish in the Nile will die. Well, isn't it evident? It's obvious. Well, if the water is blood, fish are going to die. Why do you have to add that? So we explained, because based on the Sephardo, that witchcraft, which they believed everything in the ocean was through sorcery, it could only change something that it should appear. It's a perception. But in terms of its essence of makeup, there's no change. So what is its essence, its chemical makeup, H2O? Fish can live in it. It has the texture of blood. It, it, it's 
perceived as blood, whatever it may be, all the characters, but it's not. So by saying, and the fish shall die, that was a confirmation, and that's only God could do. Right? That, that's the way we explained it. So he says, Avalios hamayim dam tivi. He said just the conversion. It's not natural, but you could attribute it to sorcery. It's true. You could attribute it to sorcery. This reveals God's omnipotence when the water turned to blood. Because there's nothing, as he said, in sand and dust you find in lice. So there's a greater proliferation of lice. Frogs are in water, a greater proliferation of frogs. Whatever, something went haywire within their reproductive systems. Okay? So therefore, people won't be taken aback to see that this is in the hand of Hashem. But how does water turn to blood? Unless you turn it, you, you attribute it to sorcery. But you can't. Even though Paro was not phased by it, but you can't attribute it to sorcery. Because why? Because the, because the fish died. It's interesting. If the Egyptian would purchase, we find that the Egyptians, they didn't complain. Paro wasn't phased. The one midrash that says that Paro, the water Paro had, his water did not turn to blood. Because since he hosted Moshe Rabbeinu, he raised him as his adopted grandchild, Hashem allowed the water to remain water. Okay? But the Egyptians, they should have been impressed. You know something? You know, we were able to survive it. Of course, that's one of the ways we became wealthy. They, bo they purchased the water. Any water they purchased remained water. Did not, it was converted from water back to blood, from blood back to water. You know something? We're able to live through it. The plague is not so terrible. Okay? But what aspect? We're not talking about suffering. It's what it reveals. It's youth cave up, kid. To see God, you don't have to suffer necessarily. But don't you understand? It's unheard of that water turns to blood. Why did it turn to blood? Evidently, God did it. And it's clear it's not sorcery. Because why did the fish die? So if you want to be truly have an honest look, evaluation of what happened, this is Yud Kev But of course, they didn't see it that way. They, it's sorcery. But sorcery, fish don't die. It's about the same thing. You know, if you can live with it and it, it's similar, we don't make differentiations. You know, like some people say, when you engage in an intellectual conversation, you say, but it's not comparable. Said it, they said it is comparable. So you say, you show, but you, you're splitting hairs. So I'm not splitting hairs. It's day and night. That, that's, that's how different they are. But it depends whether you want to see that. One, if you're seeking truth, you see they're not comparable. But if you're not seeking truth and you want to be in a state of denial, then you're splitting hairs. It's the way usually it is. Through this plague, you saw the truthfulness of his name. Moshe, when he presented himself to the Paro, he says, Which, who sent me to you? Hashem Elokeho Ivrim. God, but Yudke Vovke, the God of the Hebrews, Lokoyal Makazdam, that has nothing to do with, with the plague. That's who sent me. Who am I representing? That's not speaking about the plague itself. Makazdam Hiskushem Yuchot. When he says, God will bring the plague, it's only Yudke Vovke. Rak Pirushish Vamrishan Boelov Bishem Hashem Lokay Yoevrim. Shamatat says, and you're not willing to heed until this point. Koma Hashem Zos Teda. Now he said, Koma Hashem. He didn't say Koma Hashem Eloki Ivrim. I am a representative of Hashem Eloki Ivrim. You will not listen until the last plague. But what did Hashem say? Only Hashem. Yudke Vovke, the water is turning to blood. Kiani Hashem, Mashnem Makus Borad Betsesis Yir Hakolos Yechdolun. Now he has a question. He just explained, Yudke Vavke we don't find by, by the hail. 
taxes, but he says, he, he begged him that the hail should be removed. So Moshe says, when I will go out of the city and I will pray, the thunder will cease. So it's just give up, okay. So evidently, he just said before hail, you find hail. One location, not another location. Because over there, it's again, it's not the plague. There, it's being about the removal. Normally, anything which is natural, you have no control over nature. Anything which is based on the zodiac, also you have no control. So how could he say, when I leave the city, the thunder will cease, and the hail will, will cease? So again, it's not the hail falling. It's not the falling of the hail. It's the cessation of the hail. It's when the hail would stop. It's interesting. In regard to the, the Tzvardea, he says, I dare you. Tell me what you want. You want the frogs to be removed. He says, tomorrow. He says, it'll be tomorrow. So who set the time? Paro. Paro just says, remove it. Moshe himself says, when I leave the city, it will cease. Paro says, it's, it's not something Paro said. This is Moshe said it. Paro lo kovasho. That's the case. You know, some shit. you know why you said it? Because you knew exactly what it would stop. If you would have let it up to me, I would set the time. Okay, that would prove something. But you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't offer me the time to set the time. So if that's the case, you said when you go out, maybe you had it pre-planned. You knew it's going to stop exactly at that time. He says, It would have stopped. Moshe Yoda said, Moshe knew. So then we'd say, no, some not so clear. Therefore, he says, because since ultimately you were able to take issue with this, Paro, therefore it's not as blatant as the others. But factually, it is. There's nothing beyond God's ability. And we say, in. Um, in Hazinu, that Hashem, when somebody shoots an arrow, once the arrow's in flight, you can't reshoot the arrow. But Hashem, even when the arrow's in flight, you're able to retrieve the arrow in flight. No one said, you know, the Chavetz Chaim writes that until a certain period in history, we didn't have a telephone, we didn't have cameras, we weren't able to photograph things, replicate things, what we, all this new technology. I mean, time of Shlomo, Shlomo was chochem yikolodim. I mean, he couldn't come up with all these these, these technological uh, discoveries. Why? So he explains that the Chovetz Chaim, that because as the generations continuously to get farther from Sinai, people's belief and understanding of God weakens, and we need greater proof. You believe in God? Is God truly aware of our conversation? Is he? So, Shem says, you know, we're going to develop the telephone. This will be an invention of the telephone. And then, what you say here, you're able to hear it a long distance. So, if the human could, could is a, be aware of what's at long distance. God can't, of course. What about this? going to be a day of reckoning. And everything is going to be, your whole life is going to be presented before you. How's it possible? Every moment of your life, what kind of evidence are you going to have? This is going to be a photograph. But as we weaken, even more than for this color and sound and, and every, it's literally simulating as if it's happening now. To that degree. You understand how it's going to be? That's going to be the replay of a person's life. As if the sin is, 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 is happening again. To that degree. You know, today they have, based on te technology, they have these uh, tomahawk arrows, uh, missiles. They shoot them off the aircraft carriers. The guarded missiles. They have control of that missile until it strikes and explodes. And they can actually retrieve it. Have it turn around and go right back. This is 
the chitz Hashem, he shoots it. How could you bring an arrow back? Technical, te technology was we see we could do it. But again, that tells you. But this only to give us, it's an eye-opener in understanding what Hashem said. This, we could do it, what Hashem can't do it. R once Hashem's wrath is, is, is expended, it's very difficult to, to pull it back. But Hashem, He retrieves the wrath. When you stop focusing and understanding what God is, says when the mark supposed to take place, no dog owned by a Jew will bark. You will know how God discerns between the firstborn of the Jews and the firstborn of the Egyptians. Again, there's the discernment. But if it's nature, there's some kind of something in the air. The firstborn are dying. Want the firstborn of the Jews dying? This is Yud Kei Vavke. God has full control over everything. It's interesting. You find that, you know, Mishnabura, regarding the laws of Tashlech, on Rosh Hashanah, we go to Tashlech. So he says, Jews, they should go to Tashlach outside the city. You have to go to a, a wellspring. You shouldn't sit with them in the city. Watch you go out of the city because in the Middle Ages, there were all kinds of uh, grums. They said, you know, we're dying. The demonic plague, we're dying. The Jews are not dying. You know what the answer is? They cast the spell on our water. You know, they pray. You know, who knows? They curse the water. So therefore, that's what we're dying. They're not dying. They just go out of the city to say Tashlech. That they shouldn't have what to say. That the reason, of course, it was attributed because they lived like, they lived like, like animals. They bathed once a year. You know, they did have bodily functions and never washed their hands, you know. They were susceptible to every disease. The Jew who washes his hands 50 times a day. When he awakens, when he dresses, when he prays, when he eats, when he this. Bathes, L'Kovet Shabbos. We're always... Hygiene is, is crucial. You have to be in a state of cleanliness to serve Hashem. Okay? But what do they know? You understand? Dever. Why are we dying? Why aren't they dying? What are Jews not dying? Why are we dying? Say whatever you want. But not one Jew should die. It's unheard of. Max course, not one Jew died. The dogs did not, whoever heard of the dog not barking. Now, very often, we find that when Yaakov sent his Yishlach to Yaakov Malachim, he said, Vahili shor v'chamor, had an ox, had a donkey. So Rashi cites Chazal, what he had, he's telling me he has one ox, one donkey. So he says, it's like people say, the rooster crowed. What well, one rooster crows? Even though there are multiple roosters, but you refer to the plural in the singular. So when it's shor means multiple oxen. Hamar, multiple donkeys. So when it says, when, when Aaron hit the Nile, it says, It says in the singular. Oh, we're speaking about the species, and, but it was unlimited numbers. No, one large frog came out of the water. And Aaron took the staff and he kept hitting that frog and just, they just came streaming out of that frog. That's the question. Tony Rabbi Akiva, Omat Svardei Achas Oiso. Hear this? There was only one frog. The Shortso Moles Eretz Mitzrayim. That one frog was just teeming and just streams and streams of frog were coming out of it. Hear this? How's it possible? One frog, it's not a gay birth. They, they were just streaming out of it. It's unheard of. There should be a source. If they're coming out of the water, they just keep coming. Where are they coming from? Are there really that many frogs in the Nile? You find in the desert, the Jews complained they had no water. Initially, before Kabbal Satora, right? So Hashem says to Moshe, take your, your staff, strike the rock. Kisa says, Sela. It says the water flowed. There was enough water for the people and for the animals, everyone. We're talking about millions and millions of gallons flowed every day. 
you know, there was an unlimited source of water. So, and the rock, there's only one boulder. How does so much water flow from the boulder? It's unending. But that was the miracle. It's not that it was a source. What is the source? The source is Hashem. That is the source of the water. But to conceal it, it comes out of the rock. You have one Tzvardeya. And when it comes out of the water, you think they're all coming out of the water. The frogs exist already in the water. They don't exist in the water. Hashem's creating the frogs. They should come out of the water. It's not he, he drew frogs from all over the world and they're coming out of the water. So you, when you have one frog, but how is it possible? Just as it comes out of the water, it's no different than this. Except here, the, the obviousness of the miracle is just more obvious. That's the difference. It's like, you know, people say, you have a headache. We have a, a bacteria. Take an antibiotic. And how, do you, how are we healed? Because it arrests the bacteria, destroys it, and therefore you, you recover. Because the body itself cannot necessarily fight the bacteria. But with the aid of the medication, and why could the medication, why does the medication, you have, you have resistible, uh, resistant bacteria. Why is this one resistant? So what, what is it all about? It's what God wants. That's it. The whole interaction of medicine is what God wants. That's, that's, all, that's the answer. Except, I attribute it to the pill. I attribute it to the antibiotic. But it's the same thing. It's only concealed. Nature itself is a miracle. Because God wills that you function that way. Omalo Reb Lezis. Reb Lezis says to Rabbi Akiva, Malcha itla godos. You know, Reb Kiva was the, was, was, had the greatest mind of his generation. Reb Lezer was his, his Rebbe. He says, you know where, where you should invest your mind? Not in agotic works. In the most profound concepts. We need a mind like yours. Klach in the Olos. Go lecture on the laws of leprosy and the laws of spiritual contamination of the dead. So that it's Achas Hoiso. Bishorekis Lohim Ubokulam. Yeah, there was one frog. And it started to croak, like a frog croaks. And that croak drew endless numbers of, they came from all over. All over they came. But not, they all came from that one frog. The circle, like whistled, Srika. It's like, the, you know, what goes on in this world. They got the black party. <laughs> the drawers, they come out of the woodwork. So when this one frog started to croak, they all came. Birze. Shikshle ma shiksi betzvardim loshen vatal tzvardeya. Reb Kiva had a difficulty. What does it say in the singular? Seemingly it was one frog. So Reb Lez is not arguing. It was one. What caused the frogs, the infestation? Did they emanate from the frog? Or the one frog was the cause of the frogs? But they're not arguing the word frog is in the single means one frog. It's not like I said, what it says, chamor, shor chamor. We're talking about the species. See, there's no such thing as a singular louse. They're always in bunches. Unlimited numbers. But that's not the fact. By its day, you could say one frog. Say it's Fardim. Because each one is, 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 is distinct from the other. The, there was a miracle that the ability for one frog to give birth or that endless numbers should stream from it. The power to draw, that's called Tzvardeya. That one frog croaked, shrieked, and that shriek drew the others. That's what Tzvardeya So we have, it says, the Nile teemed with now we have a little bit of a problem. If one frog came out, so what does it say? The Nile teemed with Tzvardim, with frogs. The Mash Hayor Hishrit Tzvardim. It seems to be, it didn't come from the frog, it came from the Nile. 
Hainuke Ayor who Mashritz Gam King. It was it was it was both. It was teeming from that one frog, but they were also coming out of the Shimlo Hayor Lo Hayor Hazepoel. By Yor El Tzvardim Ko Adoma Lezera Shemotzi Apri. She means Adoma Nosin Yivula in Azera Godo. You need earth for the seed to germinate to come out. Avkan Hayor Mashritz Atzvardim. Meaning, the question is, what caused the Svar of the team out of the, out of the Nile? Was it the calling of it, or was it just the being of the Tzvardea? That was the shrieking, the croaking. It's interesting. You know, mitzvah, we go to Levincho, we go to the Seder, we go to the Haggadah, year in, year out. Tzvardeya. How long does it take to discuss the plague of Tzvardeya? Whatever it is. Are we impressed? Are we excited? So we have to excite the kids. Right? The children should not fall asleep. What about ourselves? Don't we have to rouse ourselves to really be impressed with the miracle? We're like we're numb to it, you know. Dip your finger, dam tzadeya, kinim, you know, and you know, make sure not to wipe your finger off. Don't put it in your mouth, right? Because it's plague. It's plague. It's plague blood. No, you don't. But the the heart, the neshama, is not there. You have to take. It, you have to reflect. You have to discuss it. What exactly happened? How did it happen? And what were we trying to show? And we said yud kei vav kei. This is something which it was undeniable that this is the hand of Hashem. Just pointing out far we're from really relating and internalizing what actually happened. Interesting. Many years ago, when I was sitting shiva for my father, Oliver Shalom, so one of the people who came to pay a shiva visit, Menachem Oval, he was in Shanghai during the war with the Mir Yeshiva. It was, it was known that Rav Chatzka Levenstein, who was the Mir Mashgiach, Zech Tzadik Lebrocha, he had Ruach HaKodesh. He was divinely inspired. And nothing happened in that yeshiva that a few hundred students and the community without his say-so. And they followed his word to the T. And anybody who did not, they actually, many of them, they, they, were, they were killed. Either by a bomb falling or whatever. As he said certain places are safe, certain not. And he, said, he said many things. There was a quest when the Allies were bombing Shanghai during the war. So logically, you'd say you go out to the countryside because where are they going to bomb? They're going to bomb the city. He says, anybody goes out to the country, it's not safe. You will only be safe in the city. The ones who went to the country were killed or wounded seriously. The ones who stayed, not one person was hurt. So this person was telling me, he was there, he says, it was unbelievable. He says, the bombs were falling like birds flying in the sky like in formations and you could walk on the street and you walked between the bombs that, those are his words you walked between the bombs that's what he said it's, 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 it's like you know you got him that's fired him coming from all sides the Jew doesn't affect him has no relevance to us has relevance to them it has no relevance to us the Yad Hashem the hand of Hashem so I mean a Jew who has that first hand experience you know, sometimes you, you connect the dots, you know, that's similar as this. So you'd appreciate it. You know, did we ever experience such a thing? It happened. You know, tell the story. But does the story resonate? Does it touch us? Unfortunately not. And therefore we look the way we look, and they look the way they looked. 
So what does Paro say when he becomes overwhelmed with the Tzvarbea? Hatir al Hashem. He says to Moshe, I pray to God. Now, Avel Gavshko, Mako, Mako, Hoyulo, Shir, Zayinomi. What was the duration of each plague? It had, it had to run its course seven days. Shkain Dorshu, Iposuk, Vimole, Shivas, Yom, Achrei, Hakos, Shem, Seor. It says, after seven days were completed, Hashem had smitten the Nile. It ceased. It reverted back to its, its own, to its water state. He's explaining something. It means it did not go long in them. It could be shorter. So Moshe could, could interrupt it. Meaning, if he wouldn't have prayed, it would have gone seven days maximum. But it cannot go beyond seven days. But it could be shorter than seven days. And stand. What is, what is a river? You have an underground source. So even though the blood, the water term, it remained blood. But the new water washed away the blood. So eventually it was totally filtered out. And it, it, it regained its what? Its, 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 its characteristic of, of denial. Any new water that came into the Nile immediately was converted to blood. It was the conversion. So it couldn't wash. Even though the o other blood was washed away with the new blood inflow, inflow but still it was blood. What happened after seven days? No, now what came after seven days? Water was coming. There was an inflow of water, so the water washed away the blood. It would have just kept generating more frogs. It's not the frogs are here. The same frogs are here for seven days. There's a continuous infestation of frogs. Could you imagine? If after just a short period, they were over their heads with frogs, if you had another six days of this, you could imagine what would have been over there. I mean, you have a different appreciation what the Maka was. When you, till now, how do you understand frogs? There were frogs all over. But which frogs? The same frogs? No. New frogs. As much as you would kill them, as much, whatever you would do, it was just proliferating, overwhelming. They'd say even afterwards. Because not only what happened, they stopped coming and they died. The ones that were there died. They stopped croaking. Meaning, new locusts may have not come, but the locusts would have remained. So what, what was the tefillah? To remove them, the locusts. New, there was an infestation of these wild predator animals. What would have been, seven days would have passed. We still have the predator animals. Who's going to clean up? His tefillah was to remove them. Not only that, there should not be new animals coming, that the ones who were there should be removed. What about the borod is falling? It was, we're talking about pillars of ice, like meteorites. When Moshe said, prayed, he'd say, whatever is out of the sky falling will fall based on gravity. New hail won't come. There won't be, no, there won't be a, a formation of new ice. No. Even the ice that was in midair ceased in midair. Ceased. Moshe wouldn't have prayed. It would have fallen. What does it say explicitly? It said it did not fall to the ground. What do you mean? What do you mean? If, it, if, it, if, it, if the water didn't form into ice, when it didn't fall to the ground. The answer is that it was, it was in midair. And it ceased in midair. Vodnir aloma kilo oisa makam shemesh shivas yomim. Rakstam makshlo nemabo hatiru kdeil hashlo mamako. We're going to stop here.